Welcome to the New South Wales State Archives and Records webinar titled Asylum Records in New South Wales. This webinar provides an introduction to the records created by mental health facilities and by infirm and destitute asylums that are held by New South Wales State Archives. This webinar will also provide guidance on how you can access these records. We will begin with the difference between mental and other asylums, followed closely with a historical background of infirm and destitute asylums and mental health facilities. We will then move on to how you can access patient identifying information and the access conditions regarding these sensitive records. We will discuss the main government run infirm and destitute asylums and mental health facilities in the 19th century and the types of records we hold from these institutions. If you were unsure if someone was in an asylum or mental health facility, or if you were wondering whether someone was a patient or employee, we will talk about how you can trace someone's whereabouts and status. You will notice terms such as asylum, lunatic, lunatic asylum, imbecile, idiot, and mental hospital used in both the records and in our finding aids. While they are not terms we would use today, they were used when the records were created. In his chapter, Asylum Histories, Reconsidering Australia's Lunatic Past, Stephen Garton commented that critical histories have connected the concept of lunacy to approaches in, quote, medical treatment, policing, social welfare, incarceration, poverty, and gender, end quote. These terms can help us understand how the concept of approaches to an assessment of mental illness continues to change with society. The activity of mental health is defined on our website as, quote, assessing persons believed to be mentally ill and providing them with appropriate treatment in hospitals, community housing, or while remaining members of the community, end quote. From 1811 to the the late 20th century, institutional care in specialised hospitals was the primary means of service delivery. From the 1970s onwards, this progressively gave way to a focus on community-based care and greater use of psychiatric units in general hospitals. The New South Wales Government has also managed the care for those who were poor, infirm and destitute but who were not mentally ill. Asylums, hospitals and homes were built to house and care for these vulnerable members of the community. Care for the poor, infirm and destitute is not the same as care provided as part of mental health programs. Care for the poor, infirm and destitute falls under social and community services, which is the function of providing assistance, services and or protection to those who may be disadvantaged in relation to other members of the community, especially vulnerable groups such as abused or neglected children. While New South Wales State Archives acknowledges that children were also placed in destitute asylums. The focus of this webinar is on the asylum and mental health facilities that overwhelmingly cared for adults. For further information on the records we hold relating to children, including those of the former Randwick Asylum for Destitute Children, please see our Child Care and Protection Guide. Care for the poor, infirm and destitute was also given by non-government organisations. For example, the Sydney Benevolent Asylum was administered by the New South Wales Benevolent Society, which was established in 1818 as a philanthropic organisation caring primarily, primarily for the poor, abandoned, destitute and sick. Records of the Benevolent Society are held at the Mitchell Library, which is part of the State Library of New South Wales. To obtain permission to access these re records, Research, researchers must contact the Benevolent Society Honorary Archivist, whose details are on the current slide and also on our website. Researchers should also consult the Index to the Inmates of the Asylum, which was compiled from records held at the Mitchell Library in Sydney. The index contains over 78,000 records and, as far as possible, is a listing of all the asylum's, asylum's inmates between 1857 and 1900.
The current slide shows the home page to the index, where you will notice links to the search the index available on both the left side menu and at the bottom of the page. Government, government asylums for the infirm and destitute began early in the colony. In 1812, Governor Macquarie called for the erection of a new hospital. The contract was given to Darcy Wentworth, Alexander Riley and Garnham Blacksell, who in return received a virtual monopoly on the sale of rum. Hence, the hospital was known as the Rum Hospital. It was located on Macquarie Street and began taking patients from 1816. In addition to the Rum Hospital, there were others in New South Wales, such as Windsor in 1812, Bathurst in 1824, Four, Moreton Bay in 1824, Liverpool in 1828 and Goulburn in 1834. The female factory also had a hospital for inmates. In January 1843, Governor Gipps announced his intention to remove the invalid establishment at Port Macquarie to Sydney or Liverpool. The invalids, quote, have been kept at Port Macquarie solely on account of the accommodation offered to them by the buildings which were erected when Port Macquarie was a penal station." End quote. In 1848, the convict medical establishment was discontinued and the government medical advisor was appointed to have general supervision of the colony's medical institutions. The government assumed responsibility for asylums for the infirm and destitute in March 1862, following a select committee inquiry into the provision made for the destitute by the the Benevolent Society, which found the society's institutions seriously overcrowded and provisions inadequate. On 3rd of March 1862, the Governor appointed a board to administer and approve applications for admission to the government asylums at Liverpool, Hyde Park Barracks and Parramatta. The board operated within the Colonial Secretary's Department as the Government Asylums for the Infirm and Destitute Branch. In 18 1967, the Institutions Inspection Act came into effect and provided for the appointment of an inspector of public charities to inspect and conduct inquiries into the management of all hospitals, infirmaries, orphan schools and charitable institutions, wholly or in part supported by grants from public revenue. On the 27th of August 1888, when the Officer of the Inspector of Public Char Charities was abolished, the Government Asylums Branch was administered by the new Department of Charitable Institutions. The head of this new department was appointed as the Director of Government Asylums for the Infirm. At this time, asylums were maintained at Newington, George Street Parramatta, Macquarie Street Parramatta and Liverpool. By 1911, the Government Asylums Branch administered state hospitals and asylums for the infirm and destitute at Rookwood, Liverpool, Newington, Macquarie Street and George Street Parramatta, cottage homes for aged couples Parramatta and the Waterfall, Waterfall State Hospital for consumptives. On the 1st of March 1913, the Department of Public Health assumed responsibility for the administration of the Government Asylums Branch and the Department of Charitable Institutions now known as the Metropolitan Hospital and Charities Department, became amalgamated with the Department of Public Health. The two previous slides focused on the historical background of infirm and destitute asylums, legislation and approaches. I will now briefly provide the same, but for mental health facilities. There were two systems for the treatment of the mentally ill in place in the early 19th century. The first system allowed early colonial governors to make orders to detain lunatics or the insane. This was later devolved to police and magistrates. Prior to 1811, when Castle Hill Lunatic Asylum opened, if a person was declared insane, he or she was held in a jail. The second system generally only applied to to the middle class or better off colonists who held assets. Friends or relatives could petition the governor to have a person declared insane. That person's assets would be transferred to someone else until he or she recovered. The person who was granted trusteeship of the estate was responsible for the care of the person declared insane. The first recorded case was that of Charles Bishop, 
I've included a snippet from our online index to the Colonial Secretary's Papers 1788 to 1825. This snippet shows that Charles Bishop was subject to both systems of treatment. He was declared insane, was considered a pauper and was confined in jail. He was then sent back to England in 1809 to the care of his brother William. I briefly mentioned earlier that the assessment of individuals believed to be mentally ill and providing them with treatment commenced with the use of a building at Castle Hill as a lunatic asylum from him. This continued until 1825 when the patients were moved to Liverpool Courthouse, which served as an asylum until Tarbon Creek, later known as Gladesville, was built. In 1823, the equity jurisdiction of the Supreme Court was established. The Third Charter of Justice gave the Supreme Court responsibility to appoint guardians for both natural fools and those deprived of their reason or understanding by act of God and to rule regarding the management of their estates. In making its determination, the court was entitled to call on medical evidence. The courts were rarely called upon to hear cases of lunacy and the Sydney Gazette published what it believed to be the first case in the court in May 1828. In 1843, the first colonial legislation relating to lunatics was passed called the J Dangerous Lunatics Act. This act, quote, to find the conditions under which a person could be apprehended and charged with lunacy, end quote. It gave the police authority to arrest people considered to be insane. It also allowed relatives to apply to the government for an order to have a person admitted to an asylum. The four major inquiries into mental hospitals held between 1850 to 68 led to the 1868 Lunatic Amendment Act. This act allowed the Governor to gazette certain houses as places for the temporary treatment of persons declared insane. Reception houses were used rather than jails prior to their transfer to an asylum. The first reception house, which opened in 1868, was attached to the jail at Darlinghurst. The 1878 Lunacy Act established a new government department, the Inspector General of the Insane, later Inspector General of Mental Hospitals. In 1879, a Master in Lunacy was appointed as an Officer of the Supreme Court to determine whether persons were mentally ill and to make arrangements for the care of the mentally ill and their affairs. In 1881, the Lunacy Amendment Act allowed magistrates to remand a person suspected of being insane to a reception house or private hospital. The person on remand could receive treatment for 14 days without needing to be certified. So now that we have had a brief understanding of how the government approached infirm, destitute and mentally ill persons. So now that we have a brief understanding of how the government approached infirm, destitute and mentally ill persons in the early 19th century. We will move on to the access conditions surrounding patient identifying records. New South Wales Health has made an access direction that closes all patient identifying medical records, including those of individual mental health facilities and government asylums for the infirm and destitute and those created by the Inspector General of Mental Hospitals and the Government Asylums Branch for 110 years. So records created over 110 years ago are open to public access. You can access these at our Western Sydney Reading Room. Patient identifying medical records created less than 110 years ago are closed to public access. Liverpool asylum records are an exception to the 110 year rule. They are open to public access after 30 years. For researchers to access closed patient records from hospitals that are no longer operating and that are held as New South Wales State Archives, they will need to contact New South Wales Health. If the hospital is still operating, such as Bloomfield Hospital and Cumberland Hospital, which is a form of Parramatta Mental Hospital, researchers will need to contact the hospital directly. If you are researching a patient who was in a number of hospitals, you may need to approach several agencies for permission. For example, if the patient was at Gladesville and also at Parramatta, then both New South Wales Health and Cumberland Hospital will need to be contacted for permission. Their contact details are available on our Access Patient Identifying Records Research Guide. There may be records held elsewhere. 
A number of state managed mental health facilities have not transferred all their records to state archives. These facilities include include Bloomfield Hospital at Orange, Stockton Hospital at Newcastle and Kenmore Hospital near Goulburn. If the records are found not to be part of the State Archives collection, we will refer you to the appropriate, appropriate agency to make further inquiries. Also, it is important to distinguish that access to Stockton Hospital and Pete Island and Milson Island records is given by Ageing, Disability and Home Care, which is part of the New South Wales Department of Family and Community Services. These are also closed for 110 years. Contact detail, details are on the bottom of this current slide and also available on our Access Patient Identify Records Research Guide. When planning your visit to New South Wales State Archives, please keep in mind that to access records more than 110 years old, you will need to visit the Reading Room at Western Sydney. We also recommend that you contact us to confirm whether you may need to obtain permission from the New South Wales Health or the relevant hospital. Our content, contact details are on the current slide. To access records that are less than 110 years old, you would need to obtain permission from New South Wales Health or the current hospital. You can locate their contact details on our Accessing Patient Identifying Records Research Guide available on our website. You should also contact us 10 days before your visit and then arrange with us the day that you will visit the reading room and bring your letter of permission from New South Wales Health or the hospital. Please ensure that the person who is named in the letter to access the records is the person visiting the reading room. Also, you will only be given access to the records of the individual named in the letter of permission. There were a number of asylums for the infirm and destitute run by the New South Wales Government during the 19th century. These include Hyde Park Asylum, Liverpool Asylum for the Infirm and Destitute, which later changed its name to Liverpool State Hospital and Home, George Street Asylum at Parramatta, later known as the State Hospital and Home for Aged and Infirm Men, Macquarie Street Asylum at Parramatta, Newington State Hospital, Rookwood Asylum, and the Hospital for Consumptives at Waterfall, also known as the Waterfall Sanatorium. The common type of records we hold for government asylums include registers of inmates and registers of admissions and discharges, which may be arranged either chronologically or alphabetically, and each page may be divided into admissions and discharges. They may show information such as name, age, mission, and date of discharge, total time spent in the asylum, and any remarks. The example shown is from the Register of Inmates at Liverpool State Hospital and Home. This example includes dates less than 110 years. As I mentioned earlier, Liverpool records are the exception to the access direction of being closed for 110 years and are instead open after 30 years. Basic information is given in these records, such as name, age, religion, history, by whom admitted, date of admission, date of discharge, how they were discharged, name and address of relatives and any remarks. Depending on the circumstances at the time of admission and discharge, there may be instances where not all of these columns are filled with information. We have had inquiries in the past wondering what the CW refers to in the history column. CW is an abbreviation for Commonwealth. You may also notice in the by whom admitted, admitted column the notation B of H. This refers to the Board of Health. In the last row, the abbreviation MS refers to the medical superintendent. Admission cards are another type of record we hold for some government asylums. Details recorded on admission cards vary, but generally provide the same as the register of inmates above. There are also clinical notes from Lidcombe State Hospital. These records are more comprehensive than the register of inmates, admissions and discharges and the admission cards, but are still incomplete for some periods. 
These clinical notes contain the official admission form detailing the patient's personal history and a general summary of the medical history, clinical notes and correspondence. Correspondence varies file to file. They are arranged by the year of death and then alphabetically. In terms of related records, within the government asylums for the infirm and destitute branch, we hold a series of registers of inmates that covers 1880 to 1896. These have been copied onto microfilm reels and are available to view in our reading room. There were several mental health facilities run by the New South Wales government during the 19th century. These are listed on the current slide. While an overview of each of these facilities is available on our website, I want to briefly highlight the most common facilities in the upcoming slides. Castle Hill. There are numerous references to the Castle Hill Asylum in the Colonial Secretary's Papers 1788 to 1825, which is available on our website. Unfortunately, no patient records have survived. I will show an example of this index in a few moments when I discuss the Colonial Secretary's correspondence. Liverpool. On 28 September 1825, the Grand Jurors had reported to the Court of Quarter Sessions at Parramatta that the Lunatic Asylum at Castle Hill was altogether unfit due to its lack of reliable water supply and distance from medical attention. When the new Tarbon Creek Lunatic Asylum had been completed, patients were transferred from the Lunatic Asylum at Liverpool and from the female factory at Parramatta. Tarbon Creek Lunatic Asylum underwent several name changes. From 1869, it was referred to as the Hospital for the Insane, Gladesville. In the Inspector General's report for 1915, the title Hospital for the Insane was replaced by Mental Hospital. By the 1960s, the institution was simply known as Gladesville Hospital. Parramatta. The convict, lunatic and invalid establishment replaced the female factory when it closed at the end of 1847, leaving only invalid or insane inmates still resident. From the outset, Parramatta Lunatic Asylum consisted of a free and a criminally insane division with separate registers for persons admitted into each. On 31st December 1873, Parramatta Lunatic Asylum contained 704 free patients, 45 criminal patients confined under the provisions of the Lunacy, criminal, Lunacy Act 60, and 36 criminal patients accommodated within the free division, but as British Imperial Treasury. Only female criminally insane patients were committed after 1958 when all remaining male patients were transferred to Morissette Hospital. By the 1970s, the emphasis changed from inpatient care to expansion of community-based services. In 1983, the name of the hospital was changed to Cumberland Hospital. Darlinghurst Reception House. On 3rd of July, 18. 68, premises at Darlinghurst Jail were appointed to be a lunatic reception house under the provisions of the Lunacy Amendment Act 1867, which allowed justices to commit persons directly to a reception house instead of the usual practice of committing them first to a jail. The reception house was opened on 24th of July 1868. The intended use of the reception house was for the temporary detention of persons believed to be insane pending a determination of the nature of their illness. The Darlinghurst Reception House was considered to be of the greatest value in dealing with persons whose insanity was in doubt, preventing the stigma of hospital treatment for those who recovered within a day or two, or who proved not to be insane. In 1922, the mental ward was closed since the service it offered was voluntary for voluntary patients had become available at the Broughton Hall Psychiatric Clinic. Callan Park. The report for the Inspector General of the Insane lists the proclamation date for Callan Park Hospital for the Insane as 1st of August 1878. 
Prior to that date, the hospital was managed as a branch of Gladesville Hospital. On 1st of September 1976, Roselle Hospital was established from the amalgamation of Broughton Hall Psychiatric Clinic with Callum Park Hospital. And lastly, Rydalmere. In 1888, the buildings formerly used for the Protestant Orphan School at Rydalmere near Parramatta were set apart by proclamation for the purpose of a hospital for the insane. The hospital was managed as a branch of Parramatta Hospital for the Insane. After extensive repair to the buildings provided additional accommodation, it was decided to manage the hospital as a separate institution. With a medical superintendent appointed on 1st of September 1891, the institution was gazetted as Rydalmere Hospital for the Insane on 4th of April 1892. It was not intended that patients would be admitted to Rydalmere, but that the hospital would receive the overflow from the overcrowded wards of Parramatta, Callum Park and Gladesville Hospitals as transfers. A new ward, the first designed specifically for the needs of epileptic patients, opened in 1892. Initially, Rydalmere accommodated only male patients, but on 31st December 1894, the hospital returned this 84 female patients also resident. The appointment of Rydalmere Hospital as a place for the admission and temporary treatment of mentally ill persons was revoked in March 1983. Further mental health facilities opened in the 20th century. These include Morissette Hospital, Stockton Hospital, Broughton Hall and Bloomfield. The most common types of records we hold for mental health facilities include indexes, which are arranged alphabetically by the name of the patient. Records that have been indexed include registers of patients, admission books and medical case books. The example on the current slide is from a register of admissions and case books from Darlinghurst Reception House. These volumes are arranged chronologically and generally give basic biographical information and past medical history. The registers of discharges, removals and deaths are arranged chronologically. Details given include date of last admission, number in register of patients, covered, were relieved, not improved or if they died, the assigned cause of death, the age of death, and observations. Case papers provide a record of a patient's treatment. They contain information such as admission and discharge details, a medical summary, progress notes, behaviour and treatment records, test results, personal effects lists and correspondence. The example on this slide is of a medical case book from Gladesville. Entries in their, these volumes are arranged chronologically by date of admission. The patient's physical and mental condition before and at the time of admission. The final entry for each case notes whether the patient was discharged, transferred to the hospital or if they died. Notes are made at irregular, irregular intervals on a patient's behaviour and condition while in the institution. Admission files give details of basic information and a brief outline of case history up to the time of admission, such as previous admissions, insane relations, doctors and relatives, observations on the patient's behaviour. Some files also include correspondence, such as letters from other institutions, transfer, and letters to the hospital from relatives concerning belongings and visiting. Other related records include those from the Supreme Court Lunacy and later Equity Jurisdiction, the Convict Branch of the Police Department, the Public Trustee Office and from the Inspector General of the Insane. The records from the Inspector General of the Insane include general registers to patients admitted to various mental hospitals in the state. The registers are arranged alphabetically by the patient's surname, then chronologically by date of admission. The details include name, hospital, date of admission, date of death and remarks, such as whether the patient was transferred to another hospital. The list of patients admitted to mental hospitals in series NRS 5592 
duplicates to some extent the registers of emissions and discharges maintained in the hospitals but contains far less information. The series of emission cards concern patients admitted to the Darlinghurst Reception Centre and the Newcastle and Orange Reception Houses. The Colonial Secretary's records. At the start of this webinar, when discussing the two systems for the treatment of the mentally ill that was in place in the early 19th century, we saw the entries to Charles Bishop from the online index to the Colonial Secretary 1788 to 1825. For the early years of the colony, this is the index check for references to a person of interest. Later correspondence from 1826 onwards may also contain documents relating to those admitted to mental health facilities, such as warrants for the admission of a person to an asylum. These can be located by checking the indexes and registers of letters received and the indexes compiled by Joan Rees. Special bundles, bundles are another valuable source, although these are not in, indexed. They include the Parramatta Lunatic Asylum, list of convict inmates noting any deaths, the powers of judges to sign certificates of lunacy in the absence of a governor, and the convict returns for pardons, tickets of leaves, deaths, absconded convicts, lunatics and invalids. This is an example of the online index to the Colonial Secretary Papers 1788 to 1825. The index is arranged alphabetically by name, place or subject. This example shows listed under Castle Hill Lunatic Asylum. The index provides the date of the correspondence, a brief description of the information provided in the letter and the reference details such as real, volume and page number. The example above of Samuel Levy shows that there are letters about him in Sydney jail, considered insane, another regarding his examination, his discharge and later readmission to Castle Hill Lunatic Asylum and lastly shows that there is a letter about him as a runaway. This example is a return of patients in Tarbon Creek Lunatic Asylum in May 1856. This is from the series of Colonial Secretary's correspondence dated 1826 onwards. The letter has tables for each of the returns of patients admitted, discharged and who died in the Tarbon Creek Lunatic Asylum in May 1856. The letter was sent by the su Superintendent of Tarbon Creek to the Colonial Secretary. So how do we find out if a particular person of interest was in a government asylum for the infirm and destitute or in a mental health facility? Fortunately, there are a number of different possibilities. Many of the following suggestions relate to patients in mental health facilities. We find that inmates of the asylums for the infirm and destitute tended to be admitted at the end of their lives and often died in the asylum. You can check family stories. The first step is always to go back to the record you have already collected. Ask family members and always look for gaps in the story, possible ancestors edited out of the family history and absences after the birth or births of children. Death certificates provide the most conclusive evidence that the person was in a mental health facility or government asylum for the infirm and destitute at the time of death. While such evidence provides a wonderful clue to the researcher, it will not help us if the person we are seeking was not an inmate at the time of death. Jail records often used to hold people suspected of being insane, particularly in country areas and prior to reception houses being established. The online index to the jail photographs may assist here. Employment records often provide evidence of long or extended absences from work. Of course, there are many reasons for this and does not necessarily mean that the person had been admitted to a mental health facility. Well, admission to a New South Wales mental health facility or asylum for the infirm and destitute will probably have occurred after a soldier had served. 
World War Service records may provide valuable clues to the events in the returned soldier's later life. Newspaper accounts also offer a valuable starting point for your research, as do police gazettes, as they include information on patients at mental health facilities. They include references to inmates who had escaped from a mental health facility. Gazettes dated 1854 to 1930 are available on microfilm in our reading room and at the State Library of New South Wales. In some cases you may be aware of a genetic condition that affected your ancestor. This may be another reason to consider researching into the records of mental health facilities of the time. I now want to briefly show how these clues can lead us to patient records. Death certificates can provide a good starting point as they generally show where and when an individual died. The details of the informant may also be the key to further research. This example of Christina Edgedine on the current slide shows the place of death as the Hospital for Insane, Gladesville. It also shows the informant as the assistant superintendent of the said hospital. When we have a death certificate that shows a person died in an asylum or mental health facility, we can often go straight to the registers of discharges, removals and deaths. As these registers are arranged chronologically by date of death, discharge or removal of patients, we can quickly access information needed to find other records. This much needed information is the date of last admission, and the number in the register of patients. For Christina Edstein, the register of discharges, removals and deaths showed that Christina was admitted on the 29th of January 1892 and that her admission number was 7150. With these details, we can move on to admissions, medical case books or case papers. The example shown is Christina's medical case book entry. In the top header of the pages, it shows name, admission date, number on register. This is followed underneath by basic details such as age, social condition, number of children, occupation, form of mental disorder, supposed cause, duration of attack, any previous admissions and so on. Many family historians are interested in the further history section out of the page, as well as the mental and bodily conditions and symptoms at the time of admission and periodically thereafter on the bottom, on the bottom half of the pages, followed by the treatment. William Isaac Stiles appears in an 1876 Police Gazette charged with being of unsound mind after cutting off his right arm. He was ordered to be sent to the receiving house for lunatics at Dullinghurst as soon as he's in a fit state to be removed. This entry in the Police Gazette leads us to records created by the reception house at Darlinghurst. Likewise, William is also listed in the entrance books at Goulburn Jail on 18th of June 1876. The offence is listed as being of unsound mind. The sentence is to be remanded for two days and to then be sent to reception house. The disposed of column also writes, quote, reception house, 11 July 1876. This is another record that leads us to records of the reception house at Darlinghurst. William's register of admissions at Reception House Darlinghurst shows his admission date and number, name of the patient's escort and various other information about his personal and medical history. From Reception House Darlinghurst, William was sent to Gladesville. As the dates are known from the Reception House Darlinghurst records, we can easily access his Gladesville medical case book entry by going to the register covering July 1876. You will notice that a newspaper entry is included in William's folio. This was common practice where possible as it gave staff further context and history about the patient. You can find a copy of this newspaper report on the National Library of Australia's website. They are digitising historical newspapers. 
This particular article appeared on page two of the Evening News on Thursday 22nd of June 1876. Martha Elizabeth Rumpf is listed in the 1871 New South Wales Police Gazette for the offence of murder. She was acquitted on the ground of insanity and was imprisoned during Her Majesty's pleasure. I have included this example because of this notation. The term to be imprisoned during Her Majesty's pleasure is used to describe detention in prison for an indefinite length of time until it is officially decided that it is safe to release the offender. This is a common sentence given to serious offences or two cases where a plea of insanity was successful. Martha was admitted to Parramatta Hospital as a criminal patient. You will notice the remark criminal just underneath her name. As I mentioned earlier, Parramatta had a free and a criminally insane division. The bottom of the page on the right shows that Martha was discharged on the 9th of February 1874. There are letters concerning Martha in the Colonial Secretary's correspondence in 1894. Martha had been released from Parramatta's criminal division for some years now and living with her husband. The correspondence totals six pages, although I've only included two in this example, which are the documents titled Statement and Medical Certificate to Accompany Order or Request for Reception into a Hospital for the Insane or Licensed Home. This type of medical certificate is often referred to in the further history section of the medical case books. These types of documents often provide another perspective. In this case, it is the examining doctor who is obtaining information from not only Martha, but importantly also Martha's husband. It is by the husband's request that Martha be readmitted into a mental health facility, this time the facility being Gladesville. George Edward Bolton was a teacher who during his time at Pinnacle Swamp Public School took some leave in 1902 to 1903. This is the teacher role for George. These letters located within the Pinnacle Swamp Public School pre-1939 administrative file mention that George spent some time at Kenmore Hospital. The letter on the left is written by George and advises the Department of Public Instruction that he has been discharged from Kenmore Hospital and was applying for a further leave of absence. The second letter on the right is a medical report regarding George written by the Master in Lunacy Office of the Supreme Court and is addressed to the Department of Public Instruction. We do not hold a mission papers, medical case books or case papers for Kenmore Hospital covering this period. Be prepared that not everything has survived. My last example is one recently discovered and is an interesting case. Here we have a letter from the series of the Colonial Secretary's Correspondence found by a reader using the Colonial Secretary's Correspondence Index to Convicts and Others 1826 to 1895 compiled by Joan Rees. It is a petition by Mary Fitzroy for her husband John to be admitted into a mental health facility. John was admitted to Gladesville on 13th of February 1860. As part of his history and symptoms listed on admission, it is noted that John believed his wife was trying to poison him, among various other delusions. John was discharged on 18th of April 1860 and shortly readmitted on 24th of December the same year. He was discharged again on 11th of June 1861. 
What made this example and case interesting for the reader was that John appears in the Register of Coroner's Inquests and Magisterial Inquiries on 9th September 186 as having died, quote, fellow DC by poison, end quote. Fellow DC is Latin for a person who commits suicide or who dies of the effects of, have com of having committed an unlawful malicious act. We have discussed the types of infirm and destitute asylum and mental health facility records and clues to tracing whether a person was a patient. So now let's go through the steps in finding the records when you know the hospital. Confirm the date of admission or death. Are the dates of your interest more or less than 110 years? If they are closed, seek permission to access from New South Wales Health or the relevant hospital. Check collection search, our online catalogue, under the hospital's name. I've mentioned earlier doing an agency search. I will show you how to do this shortly. Check the list of records that appear as created by, the, by that hospital. Is there an index to admissions or discharges? And if so, do they cover the period of your interest? If not, speak to a reference archivist. If there is an index that covers your period of interest and is more than 110 years, the index will need to be checked to obtain the patient admission date and number. The indexes are not digitised on our website, so this will involve visiting our reading room. The patient number obtained from the index will help locate further records, such as an admission or discharge register, admission files, medical case book or case paper. Please note that there may be gaps in the records for that particular hospital or asylum. To search using our online catalogue, Collection Search, you can enter the hospital's name in the search bar directly under the picture of Central Station on our homepage. Of the results returned, scroll down to the subheading Agencies and Persons. Let's use the example Gladesville. In this example, I have searched for the term Gladesville. I have changed the filter results on the left side of the screen by unticking the photos and images, record series and items, and functions and activities options. The results left on the screen on the right are those under the subheading Agencies and Persons. Gladesville Hospital is the third result listed. Alternatively, you can also use the advanced, advanced search option. This is useful when you already know a series or agency number. By clicking on advanced search, you will be redirected to this web page. You can choose the type of entity you want to search, for example, agency or series. You can search by number, title or description, but please remember that you do not need to enter text or numbers in each of the boxes, just one will do. In this example, we have agency in the entity content type box and Gladesville Hospital in the search by title box. You can then click on the red search box in the bottom right of the screen. Using this search, only one result appears at the bottom of the screen. Agency number 65, Gladesville Hospital. You can click on the red text to be taken to the agency page, which lists the records created by that agency. This is what the agency page looks like. Underneath the administrative history of the subheading for series. This is where the records and date ranges of the series record. There are indexes listed for Gladesville. If you know that your person of interest was in Gladesville Hospital during the same time as the indexes cover, then these would be an ideal series to check as a starting point. Please keep in mind that an archivist may need to check the index index on your behalf, it is likely that there are entries relating to other patients that were created less than 110 years ago.
If you are unsure of the hospital, then try to ascertain the type of care, such as whether the person was likely to have been an infirm and destitute asylum or a mental health facility. Check collection search for facilities operating during this time and take note of the series of records for each asylum or facility. Also, check our mental health records and infirm and destitute asylums research guides. Remember that the records of the Inspector General of the Insane can also be checked. As part of these volumes are still closed, please speak with a reference archivist. Now, what if your ancestor was in an asylum or mental health facility, but as an employee rather than a patient? If your ancestor was an employee of a New South Wales government asylum or mental health facility, then it is possible that there is a reference or record to their employment. These can be located in the Colonial Secretary's papers and main series of correspondence, such as in applications for naturalisations, in blue books and public service lists, in public service board cards, or in departmental records and in records created by the particular asylum or facility. Our Professions and Occupations Guide has specific information about blue books, public servants, nurses and medical practitioners. This is an 1894 naturalisation application located in the Colonial Secretary's correspondence. Not only does it show that Oscar Norfolk was working as an attendant at the quote, hospital for insane right me, end quote, but also that his character referee, Hugh Doherty, also worked as an attendant at Rydalmere. This public service list for corrective services shows that Bridget O'Donnell previously worked as an attendant for the insane for 21 years. She started as a female warder and was later promoted to principal female warder at Maitland in 1892 and then Darlinghurst from 1896 before retiring in 1899. There are also records created by the asylums and hospitals themselves, as well as the Inspector General of Mental Hospitals. When searching the records of each agency, look for staff related records such as salary registers or staff service cards. On the current slide, there are examples of some staff records we hold created by the Parramatta, Gladesville and Lidcombe hospitals. This is a copy from the Parramatta Mental Hospital series of staff registers. These volumes provide a monthly record of salaries paid to all staff members together with the following information, although given less frequently. Situation or job role, date of employment, age, social condition, whether resident, religion, remarks such as notes on disciplinary action taken against staff members, notes on retirement or resignation. There are no indexes to these staff registers, so research using these staff registers may be a lengthy process with no guarantee of success. The record on the current slide was created by the Government Asylums for the Infirm Department. This salary register is a record of salaries paid to all officers and employees of the department. For each staff member, name, office or position held, details of salary and any relevant remarks recorded. Arrangement within each yearly period is by the head office establishment of the department followed by the individual institutions under its control. This particular page so shows Liverpool Asylum. We have now concluded the webinar titled Asylum Records in New South Wales. We have discussed the difference between mental and infirm destitute asylums and the various government approaches and legislations to the care and treatment of the mentally ill and to the infirm and destitute. We discussed the access directions around these records and how the records are open to public access after 110 years, or in the case of Liverpool Asylum, open after 30. We talked about the main government infirm and destitute asylums and mental health facilities 
in the 19th century and the types of patient identifying records we hold created by these institutions. We discuss the value that family stories, death certificates, extended absences, jail records, newspaper accounts and police gazettes can play when locating the whereabouts of a person and how you can check if a person was an inmate or employee of an infant or mental health facility. Asylum and mental health facilities is a large and complex topic. I will end finally by encouraging our customers to view the guides listed on the current slide, all of which are available on our website. Thank you.